Finally, after three fucking weeks or something. Holy Christmas crackers. Um, I have no idea how this is going to sound, so bear with us because I can't hear myself loud like I usually do because I'm... Uh, you can't turn up your headphones? It's as up as it goes, and I don't want to yeah. make anything peak, but it's good enough. Yeah, it's fine. As with a lot of things these days, it's good enough for now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we're doing this... Um, we're doing this over Zencaster, and that's because you picked up some sort of a virus or some sort of disease from your from the Bronx where you were the last couple well, of days. It, it's still a mystery as to where I've picked up the, this latest illness. But uh, suffice it to say, I was out on my Sunday. So most people get sick, and they miss a day of work, and they're actually happy about it sometimes. But for me... I was going, going, going until 2 a.m. Saturday night. Um, I woke up and become, became sick. I lost my lunch, as they say. Oh. And then, yeah. <clears throat> and then that morning where I was set to, you know, I had a Sunday school class and it was Sunday and I was going to spend the day with my kids and I was going to play tennis with my kids and clean up the house and boom, boom, boom. And I had 101 fever. Jesus. Uh, and, uh, man, I haven't had a fever like that. And I can't tell you when, I mean, I got through COVID with no fevers really. Uh, um, like I was saying to you yesterday though, I mean, I'm glad you, you seem like you're on the mend now, but, um, things have been so busy the last few years that like when I get sick, like I got sick when I was in California, but then it carried over to when I got back, like it's such a relief to be divested by a virus of all of your daily duties yeah. and tasks. And all you have to do is just lie uh, in bed in a delirious state. And it's yeah. almost like a mini vacation, isn't it? It is. And I, I fought it at first, you know, when I first got up at eight thirty, and I got out of bed and I said, oh, oh, I gotta, I gotta make this work. I got too much to do. And I stood uh -huh. up and then I, I felt the room moving and I sat down for a minute and, you know, my wife looked at me and she said, I don't know, buddy, I don't think you're going to church today. I think you got to, of course, they're always angling to get out of church. <laughs> there was their big chance to take the Sunday morning off. You but, mean they uh, didn't go while you were sick at in bed to go pray no, for your speedy recovery? That did not no, happen? No, it didn't. But uh, <laughs> it's okay, though. I forgave them, and I'm sure God does, too. <laughs> but I don't know if my father will, because he asked, he goes, well, you were sick, but... Were they, Christine and the kids are sick. I said, "No, Dad. They just they don't go if I don't. You know, <laughs> I'm yeah. carrying the flag." But uh, it was a good day of, you know, I slept most of the day. Which I mean, I haven't done that since I was hungover. I think you need that sometimes. Yeah. You need to recharge. And and if you're anything like me, a bit a bit of a Type A, and uh, you know, there's there's lists to be checked off and things to do. You 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 will yeah. never give yourself that opportunity no, uh, yeah, unless it's, it's forced done. upon you. Uh, by an, by an illness, but you know what? It's funny that you got sick because somebody um hilarious. So <laughs> thank you for well, laughing at my plight. <laughs> well, somebody just called me a little while ago and they sneezed and then they hung up. It was weird. <laughs> God, I hate cold callers. <laughs> <laughs> this is, you've entered the dad joke portion of the show. Dad joke. No yeah. more Confucius say jokes. I just no, no, no. We're not like doing that speaking. anymore. No uh, more. Speaking of dad jokes, my my dad. <laughs> Right, You're my dad. My dad left his job recently. I mean, oh, yeah. if he were alive, he would have left his job recently. Um, do you know why? Why he wanted to pursue a career in archaeologist, but his his career is now in ruins. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of archaeologists, why do archaeologists get all the girls? Why do they? Because they have the best dating techniques. Did da da. But women make wow. the best ar archaeologists because of their ability to dig up the past. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's all the archaeologist jokes I have uh, this week. Um, you're going to have some steaming mad archaeologists out there <laughs> <laughs> writing in to yeah. voice their displeasure with your insensitive jokes. Yeah. Um, 
But um, <clears throat> thank you for uh, whitewashing that whole thing. Maybe I shouldn't say that either. Jeez. <laughs> Stop. Just, today. you know what? Let's My just God. talk about drugs and alcohol. <laughs> safe subjects that don't involve <laughs> angry people coming after us. <laughs> I, just I think I can't. pissed off uh, people in the Discord, too. Oh, come on. Stop I don't know. I, I try not to, but I'm just such you an asshole. You know what asshole. they say? Uh, it's better to be pissed off than pissed on. <laughs> And we're back. It Welcome depends on what recovery. you're into. Well, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Welcome to Recovery in the Middle Ages, the podcast about two middle-aged suburban dads in their pursuit of life, love, and recovery. I'm Nat X. And I'm Mike. And boy, do we have a show for you today on RMA. It's the return of G-Money Smooth, Grant Boykin, the editor-at-large of the RMA Newsroom. And Nat and Mike catch up on the latest gab from the Monsterverse. Uh, also, a pretty... Scary article about a uh, mystery drug that's infiltrating uh, the drug supplies, and it's very uh, just sounds like a horror story. Uh, yes. All this and more <laughs> today on a very special edition of R M A. And welcome back, everyone. Welcome back, Mike. Welcome back, Nat. Welcome back, monsters. What was that? I am. <laughs> I am barely holding it together here. I'm recovering from a fever. From yesterday, maybe a bit of a food poison. So, what did you have to eat up in the Bronx? You think it was that it was Bronx food? No, I don't know. I threw up, but you know, when I was work last week, I I had to cover for people who would normally be receptionists at some of these sessions that my company has with doctors and things. Mm -hmm. And so, I was the person checking everyone in, and you get an influx of these no fault claimants. And, um, you know, I'm inevitably going to be exposed to other kinds of germs. And uh, I'm sure I picked something up there. Well, I mean, you uh, you texted me from up there in the Bronx to show me like a nest full of eggs that apparently oh, yeah, somebody li living in the Bronx had laid in front of the <laughs> in front of your clinic. <laughs> what kind of eggs are those, do you think? I, I don't know. Pigeons? Bronx eggs. Yeah, do <laughs> I don't know what... <laughs> I was, it was amazed because that's, you know, we had two weeks of, of Mike and I just being totally out of sorts and not able to produce a show. Um, Mike being traveling for work. I'm, and then mm. I had this, you know, nightmare in the Bronx location that required me going and setting up a temporary office. And it was a total disaster. But I actually kind of turned it into an opportunity. So to, to hatch some eggs be. while you were yes. there. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I asked, um, I asked the super, I said, well, did you keep, what are those eggs all about? And he's like, what eggs are you talking don't talk, about? Don't talk about the eggs. We don't talk about <laughs> We don't eggs. talk about oh, the God. eggs. I'm like, obviously, I'm sorry. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Surprised nobody grabbed him and ran up to Decatur Avenue and tried to trade him for crack. That's what I would have <laughs> done. Maybe they did. Maybe <laughs> they did. And so that's where we've been the last couple of weeks. I mean, I feel like I've been dark. all over the fucking place for the last two weeks, and yet yeah. I haven't really left the house all that much. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's been uh, ratcheting up. The, uh, well, you, I mean, I've heard from you the last couple of weeks, and I, I, I feel like, uh, well, it's funny, you know, Mother's Day came, right? And we yes, can talk about that in a minute, mothers. but I, I got my mo my wife and my mother. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, it was Freudian shit. I got, I got my wife a candle, and the title on the candle is, This is Mom's Last Nerve, and it's burning. So, so, but you kind of sounded like that uh, over the yeah. last couple of weeks because, you know, I, I um, every once in a while I'm kind of wondering, gee, is Nat eating okay? Is he taking care of himself? Is he adequately managing his stress? And then I get yeah. these fucking text messages from you like, ah, oh, this day is it's fucking killing me. It's killing me. I'm gonna... So, I, 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 I just don't know what else to do. I gather you're scenarios. not managing like, your ah. stress, Nat. Managing. What does managing your stress even look like? So when something stressful comes after you, what are you supposed to do? Meditate? Yeah. Blow it a kiss? Yeah. I don't know. Take the dog for a walk. <laughs> <laughs> my cat doesn't walk anywhere with me. He's always in the opposite direction or scratching my eyes out. Go run around the block, maybe. I don't yeah, know, we dude. Had, uh, Mother's Day was great, though. Um, you had him. I can't believe. Yeah, that's so you that's totally, right. you totally changed the subject from how you're not managing your stress. <laughs> you totally, like totally just slipped right into Mother's Day. Well, it's an important topic, and we have so many great mothers out there in the Monsterverse, and you know, lots of great mothers at my company. And I sent out a nice message to to the staff about you know appreciating <laughs> all the hardworking 
stay at home moms that are helping it. And it's true though. Uh, you know, sometimes it's easy to forget. Did you write work. that or did chat GPT write that for you? I, you know, I am old fashioned. And I, I still like my own brand when it comes to writing. I haven't completely turned it over to chat GPT yet. I feel like people can tell the difference. I, I'd like well, to think. Those of us who use like 1-800-Flowers for certain occasions may be familiar with the, um, when you're filling out the little card, mm -hmm. um, it offers you helpful suggestions if you can't come up with anything on your own. And some of them are very cheesy and completely yeah. inappropriate, not inappropriate, <laughs> sorry, inapplicable. But then others are co quite, quite good. And, you know, you can always, you know, take a little from there and a little from your own, uh, you know your own creativity and stitch it all together in some Frankenstein monster of a card that no one's going to read anyway. But, um, right. Yeah. Was that what you did? Are you admitting to, uh, I have done that in the past. Although, although this, uh, this time I didn't have to do that. Cause I actually, there's a 1-800 flowers place near the house. I just drove there and I had to, mother's day was a fucking was crazy. Oh yeah. Because my wife, did, told, you, did you go out? Well, she told me at the literally like two days before that we were going to have like several mothers. Like she's got a bunch of mothers, um, like her stepmother, her, her actual mother. Actually, that's it. It's just two, but they both come with partners. And then um, there's a sister, and her her partner didn't come. Anyway, um, so I had to run around the day before, like putting this whole thing together. And then she's like, can you get my mother flowers and my stepmother flowers, but they have to be the same amount and they have to look the same because I don't want to offend one by getting them a better thing than the others getting. Right. So I'm off doing all this. And, um, she sends me that after I'd already ordered the flowers, but fortunately the flower shop fucked up and made them both the same, even though I paid more for her biological mother's flowers. <laughs> it's a very complicated family scene going on here. Um, and but neither one but this place that i got them from makes like old lady arrangements right you know what i'm talking about like the the flowers yeah. look like they could be for a wedding they could be for a funeral you know or a funeral right yeah. so but like they're older like an older sort of gestalt so i get the, those flowers for the mother and the mother-in-law and then i have to go to 1-800 flowers to get my wife flowers in a different color palette you know it's that kind of shit where i just want to blow my head off with a shotgun you know halfway through the day why don't you try the florist in town that's who i'm talking right. about makes the old lady uh, funeral. Oh, conditions. well, I don't know. They shall remain nameless. My wife seems to like them. <laughs> uh, all I have to say is no lilies because Christine has got something against lilies having to do with funerals, but I see can't remember exactly what. Yeah. So I don't know. No lilies. So then, you know, everybody came over. We had a barbecue. It was, it was great. Um, you know, her, no, uh, my wife's mother's boyfriend, friends i guess you'd call him i mean they're in there like Man of the hour. He's, he's like yeah. 81 so uh, nice but anyway he hasn't been a boy in a long time <laughs> he has not but every every mother's day from the first time i ever met the guy he comes in and we eye each other up on mother's day and go happy mother's day he goes happy mother's mother's day your mother <laughs> every year and it's like That's a thing great. now in that you know my uh my boys are always like waiting to hear it you know, <laughs> well, that's nice. You got a thing with your, I got a thing with the with, guy with yeah. the thing. Yeah. That's cool. So it's nice. I always like to get together and feel like I can pull it off. I always feel like I'm pulling something off when I get through mother's day and I've, I've covered all my bases. Yeah. And so we did this year. I mean, I didn't actually make the reservation and I, I kept trying to remember to, and then, um, <laughs> the woman in my office is always kind of haranguing me to remember things. She says, remember, you have to get, you, got, you have to make a reservation. And I kept forgetting. And then finally, my wife said, oh, by the way, I, I finally made the reservation. I figured you would never get to it. <laughs> <laughs> so she made the reservation, but, you know, we made sure everybody showed up. Where'd you go? And, uh, Anywhere good? Uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was really good. It was this restaurant called uh, Hilltop in Syosset. Oh, it was it's new. Really That's excellent. where the old friendlies used to be. Yes. And yes. Yes. A long way from friendlies. I mean, everything was excellent. And really, I got to get over yeah. there. Yeah, I give that. A no, it's really good, uh, and it had a you know you could spend a little or you could spend a lot. They had a nice menu, but it was great. My mother in law, uh, who we had to pick up, that was fun. Uh, Why did you have to uh, pick her up? Oh, that's a whole show. Okay, we talk about yeah. We're we're going through some uh, 
some things with our uh, relationships to our in-laws, both of us, my wife and I. So oh, okay. This has been uh, enough said. <laughs> it's been fun though. It's it's kind of a learning experience, you know, how to cope with these kinds of overbearing uh, in-laws, which everybody <laughs> can relate to. Yes, but uh, we do love them, and we have to keep telling ourselves that you know one of these days we're going to say, "Boy, I wish they were here." So let's try and make the most of it. Right, right. You never appreciate them until they're gone. Yeah, well, I have a few like that. You know, my my grandparents who have passed, I often think, man, I wish I had called more and that sort of thing. So while they're here, you know, make make the most of it. But we had a very nice time, and the kids got my wife little flower bouquets, and and all was well. Um, <clears throat> I don't want as to as my... stick too long on Mother's Day, but <laughs> we've got a, a great show for you today, I promise. <laughs> As long, as long as my wife ends the day smiling on Mother's Day, I consider it a success, yes. you know. Yeah, so long as there's no, like, left-handed, oh, great job. <laughs> or, you know, you want to hear, you did it again, Nat, not yeah, you yeah. did it again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's all in the inflection. <laughs> it, it really is. This is why texting doesn't quite, you know, because if she texts, it's like a Rorschach test, how you think they feel about you. You but, did it again, you know. Yeah. Oh, but after yeah. so many years, I mean, you, you kind of know better. And when you know yeah. better, Nat... You do better. You do better. Sometimes doing better, though, it depends on the tools that are available to you. I feel like that segue. I love to. That was beautiful. <laughs> Makes up for the segues uh, on the, in the interview. Yeah. Uh, as two men in recovery from alcohol use disorder, we know how difficult it can be to seek help for a disease that's so stigmatized. If you're struggling so to get sober, Soberlink can help. Soberlink's remote alcohol monitoring system was specifically designed to help in your recovery, not just some breathalyzer you buy at the store. Uh, small enough to fit in your pocket and discreet enough to use in public or in front of your kids, Soberlink devices combine facial recognition, tamper detection, and real-time results so friends and family know instantly that you're sober and working towards your recovery goals. This system would have been a game-changer for Nat and I during early recovery when every bit of accountability helps. Damn right. Yes. Uh, yeah, I really can't think of a better... Uh, <laughs> a better tool for trying to keep my Tri ass in gear <laughs> without Soberlink. You know, I really wish I had it. It could have made me look good like it did for Grant. That's for sure. And he's going to make 2020 talk on the show. Yeah. Sorry. Make 2023 yeah. a memorable one. <laughs> in other words, remember it. You get to remember uh, it this time. Visit www.soberlink.com slash middle hyphen ages to sign up and receive $50 off your first device and if you need and, two devices you need more help than soberlink can provide <laughs> and mike will middle hyphen your ages and oh, this is where i don't I, do <laughs> that sort of thing anymore <laughs> this is when i say for real folks now this soberlink is really awesome it's really helpful and in fact we're going to be talking to g money smooth the editor at large of the rma newsroom who is a soberlink success story he got a lot out of it you get out of a lot of it, too, and I will untie my tongue at some point. Thank you, Soberlink. You know what we didn't even talk about once during that interview? What? Soberlink. Soberlink.com. <laughs> yes. Middle hyphen your ages. So what's next? We got anything hey, what else? What is next? Yeah, we had some updates from the uh, Monsterverse. Uh, Melissa has been kind enough uh, to start compiling these things. And we also have a review. Oh, Remember shit. That? Yeah. Bra. Going to read Remember that? that or you want me yeah, to read, read it? Or, yeah. Go ahead. Let's never start saying bra. <laughs> I, don't I don't even that. understand it. What up, bra? Uh, so we have, um, you know, I occasionally go through the, uh, you know, we're always begging for reviews. So this is one case where someone actually did it. And as soon as I locate it, <laughs> I'm keeping you all in suspense sorry right, we only had three weeks to prepare for the show yes <laughs> all right uh, the uh, subject is my home oh, i love that uh, five stars with these glasses it looks like six stars is it five five <laughs> yeah. stars vinyl boompa says good evening nat and mike vinyl and boompa. as i'm currently listening to episode 76 and writing this as 112 just dropped. I've been hooked since day one. These gentlemen keep me going. I started checking out different wines about eight years ago and thought it was cool. It quickly became uncool and a horrible jagged road. Uh, at one point, it was easily downing. I was easily downing two bottles of Pinot Noir uh, a couple nights a week and definitely at least one. I would wake up feeling awful and just wanting the evening to come so I could 
do it again and again and again. As of now, I'm making great progress, but shooting for perfection. Don't shoot too much. Yeah. Um, I've been sober 88 out of the last 93 days. Nice. So, uh, yes, I've had some trips, but I haven't full-blown relapsed. Uh, this uh, tick we have can be awful, but I'm beating it back. Thanks, guys. Ed, thank you so much, Ed. I mean, and that about says it all. It's an ongoing thing, and when you do slip, um, you just get back up and keep pushing forward. No shame in that. Yeah. Um, I appreciate the um, I appreciate the uh, the review. Um, interesting how your sort of entree into uh, uh, drinking problem was uh, the wine thing, right? Yeah. Um, and becoming like involved in the fancy wines and all that because um, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal that came out, I guess it was back in the last July, but it just crept across my Facebook feed uh, the other day. And it was basically why is alcohol and wine such a taboo topic, right? It's like we talk about a lot of stuff when we talk about wine, we talk about flavor profiles, the aroma, mm -hmm. the provenance, but do we ever talk about the alcohol it contains and how that alcohol affects us? And this was an article about this and I mean, okay. Um, I guess the fact that nobody talks about the fact that there's alcohol and wine to me, it just seems like a, a, a total, um, you know, act of denial for why yeah. people drink wine in the first place. I mean, doesn't is it, count is it if it's in a Pinot Noir. Right? I mean, is it really because like, you know, you're getting that, the nose and the scent and all that kind of shit? Because if that were the case, then, you know, why don't people do that with like other drinks, you know, like soda or something? It's, or, <laughs> yeah, or the nose on this Fanta from, uh, I mean, alcohol, is I would go so far as to say it is the primary appeal of, of a bottle of wine. Um, but, you know, the pleasure of alcohol isn't much discussed amongst wine professionals. The, uh, of course, that was a sommelier who said that, um, you know, when they were talking about wine. Um, I don't know. They go on to say that it's like, it's like that kind of shame is commonplace in American culture, but the French have a, have a different view of it. Like in, in France, the, they, they kind of know that you drink wine to get, to get shit-faced, right? Right. And there, there, there's no pretense. Right. And, and while high oat wine culture you know h-a-u-t-e is like i guess originated in france france also has a tradition of wine being made you know on the farms and in the in the barns and in the countryside and it's like not like fancy stuff you know people are just drinking it to get shit-faced you know and but it was interesting to read some of the comments on that article like um you know how people were just contorting themselves like bending around backwards to to say that the reason that they like wine is because of the taste and because of these yes. other intangibles and it's not because of the alcohol in it. And I'm thinking, you know, you can really talk yourself into believing that, I guess. But at the end of yeah. the day, you know, you're just justifying your alcoholism. <laughs> it's how it I see it. It reminds me of uh, a saying, I, I just read Playboy for the article. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's right. the same thing. Like, yeah. no, no, it's not the naked ladies, you know, flapping around. It's these great articles. I mean, it was a joke. Then. Yeah. I think no one actually said that for real, but right. I mean, if we can superimpose this kind of cultural, you know, um, it's like a, a whole, um, when they're doing this and you're swishing it and you're smelling it and it's very classy and you can know where they're, and you can really get into it, but it's sort of like Dungeons and Dragons. It's all of these stories and made up rules, mm -hmm. but it's all fiction, really. <laughs> yeah, right. It's not, right. it's not really talking about why you really want to drink that wine. Um, but he, I don't know. Humans you know, it's weird. build really elaborate scaffolding, like mental scaffolding to support um, their beliefs, right? Yeah. I mean, look at the entirety of like the, the sommelier industry and the wine oh, yeah. industry. And then you look at all these studies that show that, you know, nine out of 10 people can't pick the difference between a fine Pinot Noir from the Willamette Valley uh, uh, versus yeah. a bottle of $2, uh, two buck Chuck from Trader Joe's, you know? Yeah. And it's <laughs> all, uh, kind of silly. Yeah. It's silly, but it's like, it's an enormously intricate, um, fantasy. Oh, you, know? you can get a degree in it. You can. Um, sort of like, uh, yeah, you get, be, to become a, a real, like French sommelier is, is like a big deal. You go to school and you train and it's, it's a real, it's like a certification, that's in the same realm as like a paralegal certification. Like you don't need a certification to be a paralegal. 
but they've turned it into like this degree that they can charge money for. Yeah. And uh, so it's, it's all this, like you said, it's this fictional scaffolding to kind of improve the staying power that drinking has in our culture for hundreds and hundreds of years. Yeah. It's very successful. The world's most successful marketing campaign, I'd say. I mean, that's, that's just my opinion, man. But, uh, <laughs> you know, and in the, you see the same thing in the craft beer industry, right? Oh, it, yep. Um, and I've saw a lot of parallels. Well, this is years ago when I was interested in it, but I could see like they would smell it. You'd mm-hmm. see these hipsters in Brooklyn with the hats, you know, the <laughs> ironic. I was t-shirts. one of them. <laughs> you, you were, and sniffing the, you know, oh, the hops and so forth. And this one is from here. Like, okay, guys, this has been done before. And I, look what happened. I noticed uh, our, our brewery in town, our craft brewery in town, uh, sponsored a 5K a couple weeks ago. Did you see this? I, I didn't, but I am not surprised. Because uh, be- that's where they go after the right. 5Ks. Beer at the, beer after the race, of course. But what, what I thought was kind of funny is like um, it started at eleven because <laughs> you know most five k start at like eight eight thirty. But you know the brewery's five k at eleven. You know 11 let people o'clock. sleep off Friday night or Saturday night and then get up and run the race at yep. eleven. You know, and yeah, but the idea of like um, a brewery sort of um, whitewashing like um, the fact that they're just selling addictive poison with like uh dressing it up in like a you can have you can you can live a healthy active lifestyle and still yeah, haven't you seen the commercials i mean yeah. coors is like they always sell it like the most refreshing the and how do they cold brewed the coldest most refreshing drink you could possibly achieve you know and then you try it and you're like, huh, maybe yeah. there's something wrong with me because I... <laughs> Could have I had a glass of water. That would be but better. I better have another one. I have another <laughs> one. And by the time you have the third, you're waiting for your refreshment to hit and then right. you fall asleep. Then other things hit. You know, and then you're, you're going out and 12 hours later, you're drinking vodka out of a handle. I mean, I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm... Uh, I used to be really sort of live and let live with the alcohol industry, like you know, not my, you know, not my circus, not my, uh, not my clowns, sort of kind of a thing. But mm-hmm. I, you know, I, what about the dancing bears? More, more along those lines. Yeah, that's not alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I've I've just been getting so angry lately. Like I've become an angry man at watching like mm-hmm. the devastation that this stuff like, um, you know, puts on society and individuals and the. It's a destroyer of families and a, a destroyer of everything that's good in people. And Yeah, um, and it's hidden, too. What, what drives me nuts is it, we're all being lied to, and it's like this willful fantasy that so many of us engage in, and it's perpetuated by movies, like, like everything, mm-hmm. our entire global, like, it's all pointing towards you need a drink. Not only do you need it, you want a drink. Yeah. Not only do you want it, you're going to have a drink. You know, it's like they've got us into a corner, but, and uh, we've like seen through it and you watch your friends and people you love kind of going along with it and you just want to save them, you know, but you can't, can't it, save them all. It's almost like this, uh, this capitalist dystopian hellhole that we live in is like, uh, needs like some sort of um, masking. <laughs> and yeah. keeping the general general public uh, drunk or hungover or, or desiring or another drink or something is you know it it's almost like it's almost That's... like it it meets the needs of of certain elites in our society to keep people mm. in this state because when they're in that state they're not thinking about how you know fucked up everything else is but that's just the the old right. communist in me I guess I don't know yeah that would be that's you not me I'm not a communist. <laughs> I'm a capitalist um, something, something. Speaking of communists, Vladimir Putin consulted with a fortune teller uh, recently. Did you hear this? He asked them, how long will I live? And the the psychic said, listen, I can't tell you how long you live, but I do know that you will die in a Ukrainian holiday. What holiday? (laughs) What holiday, Putin asks. The psychic smiled and said, whatever day you die will be a Ukrainian holiday. (laughs) But Nazdrovia. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know what that was. Oh, uh, yes. Sorry. The dad jokes continue. Um, <laughs> very good. I love it. Okay. What are we, um, all right. So don't I you have monster shit? You, monster shit. Yeah. Well, we had a nice little, um, uh, Melissa, I was saying, uh, I was getting, do you, uh, do you know what? From the monster verse. What? 
I went through that whole interview with Grant, and I did not congratulate on him on his major milestone. Yeah, we'll uh, make up for it, starting right now. Grant, we would like to announce that G Money Smooth, editor at large of the uh, RMA Newsroom, has achieved a thousand days sober. Awesome! Yes, Grant, so proud of you, buddy. Um, Charlie, uh, forty-three days kratom free as of May fourth. So Hopefully, more than that now. Isn't uh, it Brian, May twenty-second? It is. Are we're these the notes late. for like our show three weeks ago? approximately <laughs> hopefully everybody is still sober whose milestones we are we are celebrating we're getting caught up folks. ryan m not ryan uh different ryan is uh 16 months alcohol free or af as fuck alcohol is alcohol free as fuck yay is that what the kids say i hope not because it's uh offensive um and that is the sober versaries uh Sober Grid founder. Oh, geez, there's some other information. Can oh, we talk yeah. about the Sober Grid founder being founded? Founded? Uh, no. And you guys might remember a few episodes ago, we did a story on the founder of Sober Grid who had mysteriously disappeared while exiting an Uber in Los Angeles um, about a year and a half ago. And mm. much to uh, everyone's uh, regret and disappointment, his re- remains were found yeah. um, about a couple of weeks ago now, less than a half a mile away from where he was dropped off in that Uber. And there's a bunch of theories floating around about what happened. Um, you know, I'm, I'm in the fine bow man Facebook group and a couple of people were kind of saying what a lot of people were thinking that he may have, um, scored some drugs. Uh, we don't know, of course, right? I mean, there's, there's still an ongoing investigation, but the, some people are theorizing that he may have uh, um, had a relapse and, um, you know, just kind of expired there near near where he was dropped off. And then, But they're right. still investigating the Uber driver, so maybe, you know, maybe that's not the case. But, uh, yeah, very condolences to the, to the family and to his fiancé and everything. And uh, just well, a terrible end to the story, really. Yeah, I mean, none of that will take away from the good work that he did with the Sober Grid. I'm sure it's helped many people. And um, if nothing else, uh, his good intentions and his hard work will live on there. Um, Also, hey, Charlie led a Zoom meeting for Kratom. What's a 3D chip system? Don't know. Oh, I think, didn't Charlie print some chips? Like his 3D printer? Oh, cool. Yeah, so, um, yeah, Charlie has been a a pioneer in... uh, Kratom recovery, uh, leading meetings and and getting us to talk about it, making me take another look at my Kratom intake, which has been reduced severely since uh, my Julius seizure a few months ago. (laughs) Julius seizure. (laughs) So very cool. Lots of exciting things happening on the the Inner Sanctum and the Facebook group. Um, Yeah, join us on there. uh, The patreon.com slash recovery in the middle ages. gets you onto the discussion group and some fun uh, video episodes that are already there that we're making. Hopefully we can get that humming. Yeah. Humming. Humming. And I think with that, we should cut to the interview because it's quite uh, an impressive interview that uh, Mike R does with Grant G money smooth. Um, Yes. Grant was gracious enough to uh, give me an hour of his time last week. And we talked about everything. Lots of, public policy stuff. Uh, I apologize if it sounds too much like a, a national public radio. Uh, that's, I think it's a good thing. I enjoyed it. <laughs> but uh, uh, Grant and I tended to get a little wonky. We did a little deep dive on uh, deep dive on policy. And of course, you know, he's not appearing as a representative of Shatterproof, although the Shatterproof's work does come up. And, uh, you know, hope you like it. All right. And we'll be right back after this awesome interview that you'll never forget. Hi. Hey, how are you? <laughs> Good. How you doing? Good. Are we on? <laughs> We're on. Subject to uh, post processing and editing and so forth. <laughs> But, uh, All right. I appreciate you getting up at the crack of dawn, California time, to to sit with uh, us here. 
when I when I say us, I mean me because Nat has uh, some kind of work thing that just went uh, kind of blew up in his face yesterday, and uh, so that's why we're doing this. You and me, mano a mano, rather than uh, having Nat sit in with us. So oh, sounds good. Pleasure to be here. And with the magic of editing, it will be us. <laughs> that's <Three>. right. <laughs> Nat may show up before we talk and after we talk. Uh, yeah. <laughs> hopefully. So uh, welcome back to the pod. Uh, well, thanks for having me back. You have uh, this is your third appearance. I think it's the third, and then I did some monologues. And oh, that's right. Or like there was an end of the year, the end of twenty twenty one. I came on and we talked about the news a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's great. Uh, for those of you who are new listeners or don't recall Grant's earlier appearances, uh, Grant Boykin is a longtime listener. Friend of the pod goes back to the early days of RMA, and he also happens to be the assistant director of state engagement for California uh, for the Shatterproof organization. And he is tasked with uh, executing state-based strategies to ensure the successful launch and sustained implementation of Atlas in California. What is Atlas? Atlas is the treatment finder. Yes. Yeah. No, thanks for allowing me to put a plug in for that. First, of a little course. caveat. I am here as Grant Boykin, a friend of RMA, not okay. necessarily a representative of Shatterproof. But that said, any opportunity to talk about Atlas, I'm happy to. So <clears throat> Shatterproof's, Shatterproof's a nonprofit organization that works on um, making treatment in, for addiction easier to find and improving the quality and reducing stigma. But Treatment Atlas is our online web-based uh, locator that helps people find treatment for addiction uh, based on location, types of payment options you have available to you, type of insurance. And there's also an assessment that can help you determine what your needs are if you know, know at all what you're looking for. When I went to treatment, I thought the only option was rehab. And mm. um, so when I first heard about Atlas, and I ended up going to outpatient, but when I first heard about Atlas on a podcast, I thought, you know, I could have used that. And so that's why I volunteered for them and eventually started working for them. But yeah, we are, it sounds like you got the Google up. I can't rattle off all the states, <laughs> but if you're, if you're looking for treatment in uh, sunny Southern California, you can now get uh, on Atlas there and look for treatment, Florida, uh, Pennsylvania, New York, um, Massachusetts, Oklahoma, Louisiana. There's 11 states, actually. Did I say 10? There's 11 states all together. We're adding Wisconsin and Indiana this summer and Connecticut by the end of the year. And so we're keeping on growing. Um, and it's a great tool. And right now we're trying to spread the word that people can use this to educate themselves about finding treatment for addiction. But 90% of people who could benefit from treatment for addiction never find that treatment for one reason or another. Maybe they don't want it or they don't find it, but we're trying to tap into that additional 90%. And the other thing you can do is if you've been to treatment, you can go on to Atlas and leave a review. And that can be really helpful for uh, anyone else trying to find treatment because reviews are really important so like for this, consumers. Uh, I mean, yeah, so ahead. like this place, the food sucks. Uh, the equine therapy is not for me. Uh, you know, like, you know, exactly. <laughs> so the, the questions are actually based on uh, CMS, the federal government uh, agency that oversees Medicare and Medicaid has developed ah. sort of a standard set of patient questions. Most of them are closed ended, you know, did, did I have a good experience? Did they respect me? Did I, you know, make a positive change? But then there is an open-ended question. So if you didn't like the coffee or if they didn't serve coffee at all, um, you can leave that review. Or if these people help make change for your, you know, make your life better, uh, please leave that too. So that's my plug for Atlas. Yeah, I mean, and Atlas is like a map, but it stands for Addiction Treatment Locator Assessment Standards Platform. But just call oh, wow. it Atlas. Somebody workshop that for sure. That's yeah. a, uh, Shatterproof is an interesting organization. I mean, I, I, you know, sort of aware of them. And then when you started working for them, I became more aware of them um, in terms of, you know, what they do is sort of a holistic approach, right? I mean, they try to get the healthcare system and society to reduce stigma, uh, focus on science-based treatments and, and like any other illness, right? Right. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. Um, you know, I think our, our founder, Gary Mendel, who I first heard speak on a podcast, he lost a child uh, to addiction. 
And so he made it his mission to you know, educate himself. I think that's what drives a lot of us to RMA. We're curious and we want to figure out what, what happened to us. Right. And, um, you know, one of the things that he discovered is we've got a lot of research about what works, but we aren't necessarily putting that, that into practice. And Atlas has quality measures built into it that reflects, um, you know, what the research says leads to good outcomes. And so we measure um, treatment facilities that way. So you can compare on Atlas how they measure up to those standards. Medication for treatment, for example, or fast access to treatment or treatment of co-occurring disorders. I mean, all that is huge in, in addiction treatment, and, and it's encouraging that there's more organizations that are leaning towards a more scientific-based approach uh, to the treatment of addiction. But, you know, it's interesting. Uh, a lot of times we know what the science says and we know what we should be doing, but public policy tends to lag when it comes to uh, executing on, on scientific understanding. Uh, you know, I don't know if that's just a, um, a function of the system that we we have in this country of politics or whether or not there's other things at play. So I think the fact that Shatterproof goes deep into trying to reduce the stigma is a huge issue because I think once you bring all this out into the light, um, you know, that people struggle with this sort of thing and that it's, that it's really not much different from somebody struggling with uh, uh, another kind of uh, illness. Um, you know, you can change policy by changing awareness, I think. Yeah, no, I think <clears throat> I think that's absolutely true, and I think many of the the monksters, many of the people listening out there, will will feel that you know in themselves that they probably like me had a hard time seeking treatment because not only is it a disease that we often don't want the treatment, you know, which is stop what you're doing, <laughs> um, you know, stop doing that thing that makes you comfortable, but the other thing, of course, is that that shame and. Uh, one of Shatterproof's initiatives. Sorry, I feel like I'm just plugging all our stuff. No, it's okay. We, we have an anti-stigma campaign. It's, um, Kentucky is one of the states. California just launched um, in California. It's called Unchained California, where we collect stories and um, you know try and put the word out there about what the experience of addiction and treatment is to try and reduce the stigma. Yeah. Um, it, it's It's hard, though, isn't it? I mean... You know, one of the you sent me a sort of a list of topics that you thought we might want to touch on today, and one of them is is stigma, right? One of them is the fact that yeah. you've been sharing your story uh, yeah. out there publicly. You've used your full name on RMA. You, you know the work that you do for Shatterproof. Um, you know, you mentioned that you're in recovery, but um, you know, and I guess if you're working within the recovery milieu, um, having a story like that that you can share is an advantage, if you will. But when you're working right. in other areas, like I've always been very r rather circumspect at work about the status of my recovery. And I, and I, I think that because, that's because there's very real challenges that you have to face if you're working in like uh, the legal industry or whatever. And you're, you know, um, you have to sort of navigate that stigma and do your job at the same time. Um, what, do you, what do you think about that? Because... We'll talk a little bit about, about, you know, using your experience, you know, putting yourself out there. Yeah. First, let me say that everybody, it's a personal choice for everyone, how public they make it. And there is a ton of stigma. I think a study not long ago found that something like over 50% of people wouldn't want to work for a boss or work with colleagues uh, that have struggled with addiction, even if they're in recovery. So that's something to keep in mind. But yeah, I had, you know, in, I, I live in Sacramento and California and I've worked in state government for a long time and I had a somewhat public role that um, I had an alcohol related, we'll call it resignation because uh, <laughs> technically it was, <laughs> it was high time to leave. Um, but, you know, I left with kind of no explanation and um, just recently, you know, I've shared on, on this show before and I've shared with people I know, so I'm not all that private. But I've also never blasted it out there unless using my name on RMA is blasting it out there. But you have to sort of know what you're looking for to find RMA. Um, but yeah, recently I put it out there on Facebook and on my LinkedIn and I you know, got a lot of positive feedback and it felt good because I felt like for me, it serves a purpose of saying, here's why I left. I didn't mm. commit fraud. It wasn't incompetence. Um, it's sort of gives, you know, not the best explanation, but it gives an explanation. Uh, and then in my job, you're absolutely right. Working in 
you know, I'm not in the treatment field, but working in the area of policy on addiction and recovery, I feel like I can move all the bad stuff a little bit from the liability side of the ledger to the asset side mm -hmm. and, and, and talk about it. And I do, it slips into my work because I, you know, I firmly believe in what I'm doing and it relates. The reason I was drawn to it is because my story and my struggle finding treatment or understanding treatment um, made Atlas make complete sense to me. And so it slips in, but I use the story so often and anything you keep telling, you keep telling it the same way. Mm -hmm. And I kind of feel like I'm on autopilot and, um, and yeah, sometimes I wonder, um, you know, I, maybe it's too much 12 stuff in my head about the, you know, the, the need for anonymity and it's not all about the, 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 you know, it's the, whatever about the individual, but I feel like, am I using this for some gain? I mean, I'm pretty comfortable with it and I don't stress over it a whole lot, but yeah, sometimes I wonder if my strategy of being public is a little bit self-serving and I grapple <laughs> with that, you know, and I worry too, like when I put it on a Facebook and LinkedIn, a lot of positive feedback, only positive feedback. Uh, but what about the people I didn't hear from? Yeah. <laughs> They're harboring secret, uh, secret negative thoughts about you. It could, it could be, but you know, um, I, most of the people who, if they think negatively about something like that, it's probably due to uh, issues they're wrestling with themselves, uh, I found. Um, there you go. My situation with work, very interesting. Uh, you know, in the beginning, when I, um, when I quit, I didn't want anybody to know anything. I, I, uh, I disguised it. You know, I, I, I got the dummy drink and walked around with the swizzle stick and the ginger ale and just sort of pretended that I was, um, you know, part of the crowd. And I noticed a real shift after you know, maybe a year or two where one, I no longer gave a crap if people knew that I wasn't drinking. Um, and two, I felt sort of like almost advertising the fact, but I didn't really feel the need to go into sort of the messy part of it. Right. Like you can say, you know, I stopped drinking for health reasons, you know, which, which is entirely true, mental health, <laughs> physical health. Um, but much like if you, if you, if you had something like, if you had cancer, you wouldn't go into the nitty gritty of the treatment, you know, necessarily, you know, you would just say, I'm struggling with this thing, and, you know, whatever. Um, you know, I don't, I don't feel the need to really kind of let, let the world in on what that internal struggle looked like. I can just say, look, well, I lost a bunch of weight. I, uh, I sleep better. I, I think I'm better at my job. And, you know, it was time for me to quit. I was, I, I, I let it get away from me a little bit, which is about as far as I go when I, when I sort of tell people that I had an issue and that kind of works for me. And I, I've, I've gotten some interesting responses. You know, I, I think I talked on the podcast a couple of weeks ago about being at a dinner at a conference out in Los Angeles. And, you know, the, you get the, a couple of really sort of standard responses. One is when people are trying to talk you into, into believing that they're not drinking that much. And they're like, well, I only yeah. drink on weekends, you know, and, and I'm looking at the guy and he's on his fourth beer. It's Tuesday night, you know, whatever. Okay. Or I only drink when I'm at a conference or I only drink, you know, and I'm like, whatever, man, you know, I'm not judging. I'm just saying what, what worked for me. And then there's the other people who are really quiet and then come up to you later and say, you know, I quit also, you know, or I haven't, you know, I quit during the pandemic or I quit, you know, and it really has kind of opened up some interesting conversations. Um, so, so I think there's a way to sort of finesse it, you know, but, but something, you know, you, you can, you can sort of reduce the stigma, right. Of somebody having an alcohol problem by, sort of redefining the problem almost, you know? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And do you ever feel now, I mean, um, do you feel a little self-righteous when you're around those folks? Yes. And do you feel like you're perceived as that self-righteous prick? Um, but I, I, I mean, no, I'm, we've all been there. But, you know, I think that people who are still drinking and who maybe are questioning whether they're drinking too much when they encounter someone that's not drinking, whether that person is really advocating not drinking as a lifestyle choice or not, they're going to think of you as a bit of a self-righteous prick just by virtue yeah. of the fact that you're not engaging. you you know, you've poked through the hologram and you're not, you're not part of the party, you know, so to speak. Yeah. Um, you know, back in the eighties, there was, uh, you know, I 
grew up in the Midwest and uh, into going to all ages shows, little hardcore bands, and there was a whole um, <clears throat> straight edge movement. Mm. And you know, we had kids in our scene in Madison who gravitated toward that. And I had this weird admiration to them because I thought, what you know, what control they had. Mm -hmm. you know, like we're, we're not going to do the <laughs> the drinking and drugs part of the sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And I thought, but I, I. I wasn't there yet it took me <laughs> right. until, until I was 50 to become a cool straight edge kid. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I did have this sort of respect for that, but all, you know, through my drinking years, I would kind of wonder about people who didn't drink and, you know, all the same stuff that I'm sure uh, comes our way now in terms of how people think of us. But in some ways, do you feel like, um, oh, this is kind of your superpower. You can walk through that post-conference dinner and, and, uh, and be, you know, there's no kryptonite for you anymore. Yeah, I think that's a great way to put it. Um, I, I definitely feel like this is a, a superpower. Like yeah. the script has been flipped in my head to thinking yeah. not drinking is no longer a liability. It's an asset, you know. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's a, what's the thing? It's a feature, not a, not a bug. <laughs> there you go. Right? And And doing the podcast, even though I know you're, anonymous but so much slips out and you've you know people have found you i don't try very hard it. you know <laughs> yeah, so you're not trying super hard i think you're you know if your workplace found out and had an issue they'd be like oh that's cool that he's not <laughs> like blasting it out there like grant is so um yeah i mean you know i you know I, you know aa has the tradition of of remaining anonymous at the level of print and media and so forth and and yeah. uh you know, I think that's a good rule to live by in a business like mine. My company is very sort of um, old-fashioned and um, conservative. You know, it's the insurance industry, right? There's, yeah. there's very little, you know, dynamic shit going on in the insurance industry. So, I mean, I, I actually, I, I screwed up a couple months ago. I got interviewed by a Wall Street Journal reporter about working from home, and I was a little too free with my comments about, you know, what I thought about having to come into the office and what I did when I was actually there and the article got published and, you know, they used my real name and everything. And, um, although not the place where I worked because, right. uh, uh, but it was, you know, and nobody could discover that on LinkedIn. Or yeah, I mean, it was pretty, <laughs> right. It was pretty obvious. And so I got kind of called onto the carpet for that. And, uh, it gave me a good lesson in, in, you know, keeping some things inside your head as opposed to airing them out in, in, in the general public. Um, yeah, I had, a, I had a little talking to, I mean, I was, uh, I was misquoted and miscarried. What I said was mischaracterized. And I, I think the wall street journal had an agenda that they were pushing about getting people back to the office, but I should have known better, you know? So um, knowing what I know about my company in that respect, uh, I think it's probably better that a Google search of my real name with, RMA or alcohol, whatever is it doesn't doesn't pop up, right? Know? And that's a decision and, that I've made, you know, for job preservation. I would say, you know, yeah, no, and that's top smart and it makes sense. And you know, I'm out there because of the job that I have, you know, yeah. And um, but even when I was still with the state, a little, a couple of years um, after after the downfall, but before I came from to Shatterproof, I sort of, you know, developed a if somebody asks or it comes up, I'm just going to be completely open about it, even in the workplace. Cause I, mm -hmm. I found more good came from that than, than bad. Um, with uh, people come out of the woodwork, like you mentioned before and say, I struggle too. What can, you know, let's talk. And, um, so it's been more of a good thing than a bad thing, but I totally get where you're coming from. I mean, you can, uh, you can drop enough code words and, uh, dog whistles, if you will, that, people who want to talk to you about not drinking will come and find you later and talk to you about it. You know, friend of bill, yeah. Stuff like that. <laughs> maybe not that Code one. Words. I, no. <laughs> I'm, I, my relationship with bill is more of a <laughs> arm's length acquaintance. So. No, I know but if somebody <laughs> says that I'm like, yeah, I'm part of your, your greater right. tribe. Yes, and exactly. I get it. And then we can drill down and talk about my feelings toward 12 steps. I mean, it, it the, uh, the history of, of anonymity, you know, when it comes to, uh, the uh, recovery movement is kind of interesting. I mean, um, watching uh, anonymous people, you know, yeah. they went through the whole history of how, you know, in the, 
you know, in the '60s, you know, all these Hollywood folks coming out and testifying in front of Congress and to sort of break the stigma. And then you had Nixon swooped in with the war on drugs and changed the whole thing to punitive and interdiction rather than uh, treatment being the focus, and that all just sort of dried up. Uh, but it seemed like we were heading there, and then just kind of took a hard turn, you know. Yeah. And we'll talk, I guess, more about punitive uh, uh, remediation of, of uh, drug and alcohol issues in a little bit. But, um, you know, I brought up the... Uh, can, can I just go back to the anonymous? Yeah, I was, that's it? exactly where I was going. Cause, okay, yeah. go, go ahead. But nope, go ahead, because you're okay. going to D.C. this summer. and uh, Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, anonymous people was one of the things that I watched in my early days, and it, it did – it. Um, I wasn't there yet in terms of being out there and, and sharing and and, um, and recovering out loud. But I just I really I found that movie fascinating and kind of empowering for people like us who struggle. But I also think that when it comes to the twelve steps and the, the emphasis on anonymity, the way I read it, that's to protect the organization. So mm. um, you can be out there as much as you want, but just you know don't my sense is that it's about not bringing the organization into the spotlight. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. More, more, than, more organization yeah. focused than individual yeah. focused. Right. Yeah. Um, although anonymity is still preached as a, a virtue in the rooms. Yeah. 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 I mean, you shouldn't, you know, probably some would say I'm going too far using my story for, <laughs> you know, for for the career that I've chosen, that it you know calling it an asset, on the, you know you, I think there's something in the big book about this shouldn't be our vocation, you know, or this shouldn't be a, you know what we make money off of the whole recovery thing. So well, I mean, I, I'd hardly say you're making money off of recovery. I mean, yeah. you, you, you got to feed got to feed the cat, you know. I mean, shit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Speaking of which, I could see the cat right behind you. Mm. Cute kitty. Mm. Yeah, Percy. Percy. Is that the one we see on? Uh, uh, on the, the Discord, only have, you, only, so. you only have one yep, cat, yep. okay? Because yep. people collect cats. One is to you know, usually if there's one, there tends to be another one lurking around somewhere. Well, I'm the one who does litter box, so, <laughs> so I don't one cat. collect cats. <laughs> yeah, one cat's fine. Thirteen years old, he's not long for. With oh us, wow! I'll miss him when he's gone, but I'll be. I'm looking forward to a future with no kids and no cats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my dogs are still young, unfortunately. Um, so, travel. Let's talk about travel for a minute. You right. took a trip to Hawaii recently. How yeah, was that? So, was, I, I, I got to say, before you get started, we on the East Coast are insanely jealous of the fact that people in California can get on a plane and be in Hawaii in what, like four and a half hours? Likewise, Europe and Puerto Rico yeah. and all the nice sites in the Caribbean for, for us. On yeah, the, but you guys got Baja and, you know, you can get down there. Yeah. 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 Anyway, that that, said, that's true. But yeah, Hawaii is always, if you're on the West Coast, Hawaii, you can find a direct flight to most of the islands from even a city like Sacramento. And just once I get through security and I'm on a, a direct flight to Hawaii, I feel like the weight of the world lifts off me because, mm. you know, it's just, I know no what it's shit. Be like. <laughs> it might be rainy a little bit, but it'll be sunny. It'll be nice. It's Hawaii. Just, it's so relaxing. It's one of my favorite vacations. And we went to the big island this time that I'd never been to. Mm. Less touristy than Maui. And like all of them, interesting terrain from dry desert um, with it's the youngest island. So it's all these lava rocks. And so it's like this strange black wasteland. Um, and then the the north side is kind of lush but yeah we were talking about it and we were really surprised that my son who is about to graduate from college yay um yeah awesome decided to he wanted to go with us and um you know when you have a 21 year old they don't always get excited about traveling with their parents but he did so he set it up to go for his spring break and it was a really nice time um you know to talk to him about worries for the future you know just graduating college and wondering what life's going to be like and all that sort of thing so it was a nice way to slow down and just be with him and my wife my daughter didn't go but um, she's different school schedule and goes to school on the east coast yeah those school schedules are tricky to sort of try and plan a vacation outside the summertime did you uh you miss the mai tais 
coconuts, the yeah. all that kind of so, stuff. Before you land, um, oh, what were we on? I don't know. I know Alaska Airlines does it, and um, Hawaiian. Many of them will have. You can have a mai tai. You know, like just before d- descent, they give them out for free. And uh, mm. yeah, but I, I didn't miss it at all. My son's twenty one, and we stayed at the last place. We stayed several places, but the last place we stayed had a. It was like a condo complex with a bar and pool and. He would have a beer or a fancy frou frou rum drink, and um, yeah, it doesn't. You know, I'm two and a half years out. I don't feel like this. You know, I, I do sometimes <clears throat> wish that I had timed it differently so I could at least have one beer with my legally, um, you know, drink beer drinking son. But, <laughs> uh, that didn't work out, but I don't think life is any the worse for it. Yeah. Um... You know, my son's 18 and has sort of started drinking. I mean, you know, he drinks beer with his friends when he goes out. Uh, and n- knowing what you know about Wait, alcohol. he's not 21. How does he yeah, do that? Yeah, well, <laughs> pick your battles, I say. Um, exactly. But I mean, knowing what, because I struggle with this, that knowing what I know about uh, you know alcohol and, and where it sort of inevitably leads up if you practice drinking enough um you know part of me wants to just grab them and shake them and be like don't do it you know but that would be crazy yeah because they're going to do it anyway and you know some lessons people have to learn for themselves but you you want to kind of save them from that struggle right and you know there being a genetic component to addiction and you know, uh, environmental component and just existing in society now, you know, there's all this pressure to drink, to celebrate, drink for sorrow, drink for every other thing. Like, I don't suppose there's any way to save my kid from the exposure to alcohol because it's everywhere. But I do, if I see him drinking a beer at home, uh, I get a little, you know? Yeah, no, I'm the same way. But, you know, the one thing that I would, I would hope is that some of the positive that came out of my struggles is the kids saw it mm-hmm. and they're conscious of it. We've talked about it. We think it's opened them up to tell about their experiences and they've had some They're My daughter's 20 and my son's soon to be 22. Um, they've experimented with things. There are stories there's to tell. So I'm not going to go into the details, but I do feel like they've seen me and um, they know, you know, they know how to, get help if they need it. And I feel like arming them with, uh, you know, some knowledge and the ability that to get help and uh, just the example that somebody can go through hard times with that stuff and then make it through. Um, it's all you can do. You can't control everything. You can't, you can't, uh, you know, I, I have a, I have a pension to want to control everything. I'm working on that. I've been working on that for, quite a few years now, with varying degrees of success. But if there's one thing I learned from my son's high school experience, because when he was a freshman and sophomore, he got way into the, the marijuana scene yep. and, uh, or cannabis or whatever, whatever I'm supposed to call it these days. But, uh, I call it pot still pot. Okay. He got way into the Nobody pot. Nobody else does though. Kids will make fun of you. Don't say that. <laughs> Don't say that. It's um, cannabis, you know, and he, and so I think the, the virtue of by virtue of the fact that I do this show and he knows that I do it, um, he feels pretty free to talk to me about his yep. experiences with that and his experience with psychedelics and whatever else. And you know, I, I sound like a broken record because whenever I talk to him, I said, you know, I, I know you, you know, this is a part of like growing up and this is a part of what kids do. I said, but fentanyl, fentanyl, fentanyl. That's that's all I keep saying you know like you don't and you know and these kids are a little savvier than you give them credit for because he's like yeah you know we all have we all have test strips and you know anytime we would do get a a pill and we weren't sure where it came from we'd we'd do a a fentanyl test strip on i'm like jesus that's (laughs) it's more than i ever did you know uh uh, when i was doing drugs like i was just oh that's a green pill just let me put that in my mouth and see what it does you know i mean the the stakes are a little higher i guess nowadays but it's interesting that, that that this is uh this is out there in the in the drug using culture 
at least among yeah. the high schools, you know. It is in college too. My um, daughter, who lives in the land of the Borg, which you've covered, new term to me. The, you know the gallon oh yeah, jug the, the gallon the jug they carry around harm yeah. reduction because you you know what's in there and nobody can slip anything in. <laughs> yeah, I don't but know. Um, <laughs> she when she was home for the <clears throat> for the holidays, she said, you know, some of her friends go to raves and things. I didn't even know raves were still a thing, but mm. um, she asked if if I had any Narcan and just, I pick stuff up at conferences all the time and yeah, I gave her a bunch. And mm. actually there's this new thing called Cluxado. It's the new Narcan. It's naloxone, but it's double strength. You get two nasal sprays, but each one is double the strength. And um, <laughs> so <laughs> Which I guess, about that too. I guess you need that because the drugs yeah, are so I much mean, stronger. I'm saying that with the um, synthetic opioids, um, they're finding that um, they often have to give a second dose. But if you can have the first dose be double strength, then it's less likely you'll have to give a second one. And, wow. Yeah. So I just pick stuff up at conferences. So if anybody asks, I can, um, you know, give away stuff. Have you heard about the? Uh... You know, I, I did. We did a show on Kensington in Philadelphia, the Skid Row down mm-hmm. there, a couple of weeks ago, yeah. and. You know, one thing I didn't touch on because I didn't, I don't think I realized it at the time is, is people are getting into this new drug. It's like some kind Xylazine. of xylazine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That, that Narcan is uh, ineffective for, from what I understand. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm not an expert on xylazine other than it's a vet, it's got veterinary uses as a mm. tranquilizer. And all of a sudden I'm stumped. I don't know if it's an opioid. I don't think it is, Yeah, uh, but it's mixed in with the synthetic opioids and with other things. And, um, you know, I don't understand the, the science of it, but it creates these um, skin sores as well. Yeah. Yeah. That are horrific. And, uh, I mean, it doesn't sound like that's going to get much traction as like a suburban party drug. It seems more like a not, not if you skid row flavor, but, in it. <laughs> you know, but, uh, yeah, right. Who knows, right? I hey, mean, I got this thing. It could kill you, but if it doesn't, it's going to give you like nasty bed sores. All <laughs> Sign me up. Sure, I'll try that. <laughs> well, I, I mean, the same way fentanyl kind of wormed its way into everything that the kids are buying nowadays. Like, you know, maybe the xylazine is a way for drug dealers to stretch the product, and it's going to going to start popping up in the burbs. You know, who knows? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I don't know why we in the suburbs think we should be immune to. Shitty, the shitty drugs that they're using in the inner city. Maybe that's a, an elitist sort of view of, of drug addiction. Uh, yeah. I don't know. But. No, and you, you should know you did your travels and, and um, w- when you were in search of your drug of choice back in the day. And I know from my um, own journey through outpatient treatment, you know, my image of who a crack user is or who a meth user is has changed drastically. It's everybody. Oh, you know, yeah. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's just, um, you know, in a place like uh, the Bronx or, uh, you know, Skid Row, it's just more out there, right in your face. Uh, and, you know, and of course, drug addiction and poverty go hand in hand. And, and poverty is, uh, you know, more African-American and Latino people in poverty than there are white people and so on and so forth, even though the usage yeah. is roughly the same, you know, in terms yeah. of... Uh, at least it is with cannabis. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not sure if they've done that study with cocaine. Probably, probably the same. You know. Yeah, yeah. And um, but access to treatment, of course, is not. And um, uh, right. you know, fewer, you know, black and brown folks get buprenorphine or methadone medication. You know, which is proven to be effective for treatment. Um, much less likely if you are black or Latino than if you're white. Yeah, and is that a function of? Um, well, I mean, it's interesting just looking at, uh, at how doctors are, are not able to prescribe these things. And, and the, the new federal regulation that came down, you know, that basically says you have to have an in, in-person visit and uh, you know, all these other strictures before you can actually get the prescription. I'm sure it's easier for somebody in a higher socioeconomic uh, arena to access that care than it would be, you know, if you, if you're doing it in a, um, another situation, so yeah, I, I was just as you were talking, I was trying to Google uh, what was her name, um, Ice Wander. There's so there's a Scientific American, I believe it's Scientific American. They did a piece on it, but there's a podcast called Lost Women of Science, and the recent season was all about. 
why can I not remember her name? But it was the woman who pioneered the use of methadone. Mm. Um, and, you know, a lot of resistance against it, replacing one drug for another and, and all that. But it turned out to be very effective. Um, <clears throat> where was I going with this? Um, oh, but, you know, quickly, the regulations that got put in place favored you know, like you have to do it at a certain place and an over uh, opioid treatment program as defined by the federal government. And so this whole marketplace sprung up of an industry of methadone clinics that now have um, money and the power to lobby and say, you know, where good people say, why can't people just go into a pharmacy or their primary care physician and get methadone? There's a whole industry to say, here's mm. why that's a bad idea. <laughs> so, sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's an interesting, uh, I mean, the, the influence of money in addiction treatment is, is, uh, we could do a whole show on that. Um, you yeah. know, based from the rehabs onto the, to the methadone people to, to, you know, the reasons why certain medications are harder to get, but, right. um, you know, we, we had discussed, uh, well, Nat and I were going to planning on covering this week the why involuntary treatment for addiction was a bad idea, which sort of dovetails a little bit into the influence of money in, in treatment. Um, I guess there was a New York Times op-ed that came out in, at the end of April um, that was written by a father uh, who was arguing in favor of involuntary treatment uh, because his son struggled with drug addiction for many years. That guy was famous, right? There's a movie out about his story. Yeah, I, I don't remember Nick, the name of it, but Nick Nick Chef is the author, and um, his book was Beautiful Boy. Yeah, and that's right. That that's a, right. Mo- made into a movie with um, was it Steve Carell? I, yeah, I can't. Yeah, remember I, I think so. It. Yeah, it was a good movie. Yeah. And then his son actually wrote a book subsequent to that. But yeah, it was just uh, it was really hard to watch, but it was a good movie because you know addiction movies. Um, don't follow the normal plot of a movie where there's hardship, conflict, resolution, and everything's fine. It just goes back and forth. It's really hard to watch. <laughs> yeah, the story arc is not, is more complicated. But yeah. Um, but yeah, anyway, back to his op-ed piece. Yeah, I just, you know, if, I sometimes I have a hard time getting my getting my head ar- around this whole discussion because, you know, I guess I, I I'd like to know what they mean by involuntary treatment first because i mean in a sense we have involuntary treatment already it's jail right i mean wh- whether you you know it, it's basically uh, um you send somebody to prison and they dry out in prison and then boom treatment right uh well, you're assuming there's no access in, in prison or jail and i'm as- yeah i i'm kind of wrong. assuming that access to to medically assisted treatment is maybe not as available as it would be if you were just engaging on the outside with a physician. Um, Although it's becoming more, more common and, and um, Medicaid just allowed for a longer period. You can be on Medicaid now within 90 days of release and receive medication assisted treatment before being released. So I think but I re- yes. remember yeah. reading an article on, on that. And, and of course you also already have involuntary treatment. Uh, you know, if you get a DUI, one of the conditions, uh, uh, of of uh, getting your license back is you have to go to a class and you have to you know uh, attend a certain number of AA meetings, get your card s- stamped, whatever. So what are we actually talking about? When we're talking about yeah, involuntary no, I, treatment. I think you're right to say what do we mean by involuntary treatment? Because I would even argue that somebody like me who goes into an outpatient program and says I'm here, help me. There's involuntary elements to it if you want to stick with it. Um, you know, they have urine testing and, um, if you decide, well, help me get off alcohol, but I want to use cannabis, you're going to be booted from the program, most right. of them, because they're abstinence only. So you can't find your thing. And I, you know, it's kind of interesting. Most of the treatment industry refers to the people they help as clients, but there's not really a customer service orientation. <laughs> uh, we'll give, we'll give them what they want. But, you know, I think there is a range I've been looking over the past couple of years at stories about changes in Massachusetts law over, um, I forget what they call it, but um, basically a conservatorship or somebody placing themselves or a family member on some sort of involuntary treatment program. In California, we've um, created these care courts that I need to look into more, but it's, and we're also, there's a bill this year to look at um, 
or that, uh, that would expand the definition of what is gravely disabled mm. uh, for the purpose of locking somebody up on a um, what we call California, California Welfare and Institutions Code 5150, which is the 72-hour and, right. and the 5250 that, um, that extends it. And as somebody who has been on a 5150 hold for alcohol, never mentioned that to the RMA crowd before. Mm. Um, it was my great rubbing alcohol incident. <laughs> alcohol is cleared out of your house. You start looking. Um, Kitty Dukakis has that in her story too. Oh yeah. Um, but my experience was, um, I didn't think my crisis warranted that hold, uh, but you know, that's what I would say, right? But if a fifty-one fifty hold is is more for um, mental health, right? I mean, it's not and sub- substance use disorder too. Okay. Yeah, um, you know, it's it's all of that, and the sort of expansion of the definition of gravely disabled um, would would um, in SUD substance use would be wrapped up in that as well, and it'd just be easier and. I talked to a lot of county health officials and I was talking to a doctor recently who works in the publicly funded health system here. And his issue with that is that somebody's in crisis on a psychiatric hold. There's medications you can give them to get over the crisis. But mm-hmm. Somebody who's got an addiction to meth or cocaine, you know, there's nothing you can give them. So it's hard to justify what are we going to do with this person in 72 hours? that's going to stabilize their condition and, um, but at the same time, you read a story like Nick Chef's, and I'm a parent. I get it from a parent perspective. If if the if I feel like that's what I need to do to save my kid, I want somebody to give me or somebody else the power to lock them up and do what's best for them. Even mm-hmm. if the evidence says that's not going to work, um, at least for that period, I know that they'll they'll be safe. And I we have a lot of parents who come to volunteer or donate which was shatterproof and um, those are tough stories. No parent should ever have to bury their kid and yeah. far be it for me to tell people what they should think, feel or believe. But um, yeah. Yeah. It's um, it's a tough balance. Um, but I mean, there are, there are plenty of studies that show that forced treatment can be effective in certain cases. And, and even if you look at just, incarceration there's no shortage of alcoholics or addicts who will say if, if i wasn't thrown in jail yeah you know i'd still be using today i mean jail was the best thing that ever happened to me you know um you know but i, I think it depends on context right i mean you have to i mean it's you have to have a plan right because the, the type of the intervention intervention the population being treated the context that the treatment is provided in all make a difference right yeah. Um, you know, to, to, to successful outcomes. And, you know, the last thing you want to be doing is advocating putting people in more people in jail to dry out. Cause I don't think that that is a sound public health strategy, not to mention right. uh, just a sound strategy for, uh, uh, for society and at large um, incarcerating people with, with that sort of a, a problem. But, but there is a social interest in, keeping out of control addicts away from, you know, the uh, breaking into houses and stealing shit. <laughs> so, you know, where, where do you draw the line? I mean, I mean, you have drug courts, right? I mean, and those have been fairly effective by, by the um, statistics and studies that I've seen. Um, you know, you have judicial supervision, you have substance abuse treatment, um, and that's, there's some legal pressure there. So is that, is that forced treatment? I guess you have the option to decline and simply go to jail, I guess. Right. And I have talked to folks, uh, you know, I, I think I shared on this podcast before that I, I spent a few months uh, leading group sessions in the evening for people who were men who were trying to, they had custody cases with their kids and many of them were in drug court. And, um, once you, sign on the dotted line and you're in that you're pretty heavily scrutinized it can be a great thing if you work it well but it can um it can lead to other consequences and some said that they had to really think about it and you know would six months or eight months in jail maybe be easier than a year of drug court and uh you know all the you know the testing and the 
going to classes and everything that that entails. So, um, and you know, I'm, I'm here, I bring the news. I don't say this is right. That's, that's wrong. I'm always going to take the wishy-washy perspective of, yeah, I can see both sides of involuntary treatment. Sure. Sure. But um, I, I do think too, like of the first time I went to outpatient, I, I went because things got really messed up. Oh, no, but actually, I went first before things got really messed up. And, uh, but I wasn't quite ready. I, I, you, know, it, you know, so if somebody had forced me at that time, I think I would have counted my time until I was done with treatment and said, okay, now I'm done. Now I can go do what I want to do. Yeah, that's what I would have done in the 80s when, you yeah, know, if they yeah. pulled me off the street from a, for a crack bust and threw me mm-hmm. in, I just would have popped mm-hmm. right out and done the same thing over again, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe what's what's uh, what's missing in the whole discussion is some sort of um, you need some sort of set of standards or some sort of comprehensive science informed intake where you can evaluate people and say see say whether they're a a good candidate for a particular kind of treatment. Um, you know, if you if you're just thrown into drug court and in sort of active addiction, like I was just talking about. Um, you're going to fail. I mean, the threat of, if the threat of losing your family, if the threat of like dying is not going to like snap you into some sort of, um, you know, grip on reality, the threat of going to jail for six months in drug court is not going to do it either. Yeah. Right. Uh, but yeah, I don't know if you can come up with a scorecard like that. That's going to be fraught. You know, they do that for, uh, they talked about it for, for sentencing. Let's look at this person, but the characteristics are always going to have a, a bias, socioeconomic, and and, sure. bias. and and I do think that a lot of what makes for success and recovery is kind of the external social capital that people have, the the family support, the you know income, whether they have a job, whether they have things to go to and mm-hmm. do, and all of that shakes out differently depending on the color of your skin or the level of your income. Yeah, so basically, we're fucked. <laughs> I, I'm not an. What's opt- the answer, Mike? I'm not an, coming to you for the. Not answer. an optimist. We all get unfucked. I'm not an optimist when it comes to uh, society being able to deal with large systemic problems in a comprehensive way that benefits the most people. I, I we don't have a good track record with that kind of thing. I mean, look at our healthcare system; it's just a fucking mess. You know, to to. I mean, the problem couldn't get much bigger, could it? I mean, addiction in this country with with uh, fentanyl and alcohol and everything else, like how much bigger would it need to be before it was recognized as the, uh, even looking at it from a capitalist perspective, the, the, the hit to productivity, the hit to, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. it, it just seems so nonsensical to me that we just ignore this problem, stigmatize the people who, you know, are suffering uh, for what reason? I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, you could make a lot. You could make a lot of money off addicts. Maybe that's maybe that's the issue. Keeping things the way they are, uh, you know, an addict is just a, a profit center, really. Yeah. Well, I think private equity um, has discovered that a little bit and has gone into the rehab space, from my understanding. And I don't know. Pri- private equity is a structure where you you um, gather a whole bunch of money from big institutional investors. You buy companies, turn around and make a profit, make them leaner, mm-hmm. Yeah, which is not always the best thing in healthcare. I mean, Get rid of the horses. No more equine and, therapy. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and <laughs> no more yoga. No more medication assisted treatment. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so I think people have found profit in it. The one thing I have found working in that space is um, I interact with a lot of treatment providers. It's an industry where I feel really good that most people come to it because they they really care and have a passion for doing it. Does that mean uh, there aren't people who are looking for the profit angle and they're shady actors? Of course, and you read about them in the paper, but it's really a nice group to work with in general. Even if I, even if they're uh, you know we do the twelve steps here and we make people pay for it, um, <laughs> yeah, I, it's just very old style treatment that. Well, I, I think a lot of people who suffer from serious addiction and who have maybe have a criminal record who have lost the ability to sort of make money in a in, in a socially um, acceptable way. I mean, you don't have a resume. You have you you have the tattoos that you have. You know, you're you're just not you you've gone so far outside of normal society that 
coming back in and getting a job like selling vacuum cleaners is, is not going to happen, right? So what do you do? Yeah. What do you know? You know drug addiction, you know drug treatment, and you go into that, you know, because yeah. that's, yeah. that's the way to survive, you know, and you can help people at the same time. It seems like a win-win. Yeah, right? yeah exactly. Feel good and, um, and help people and use your troubles to, to yeah. an advantage, you know, yeah. Because then you circle right back to stigma there, right? Because those folks who are working in the treatment industry – or maybe in some part doing it because they can't get a job because of the stigma, because of the addiction and so on, you know? Yeah. So it's, I don't know. Everything comes back to, I I was looking at the, you know, I was thinking about civil commitment that you mentioned earlier. And and I guess there was a study that was published in the journal of substance abuse treatment in 2011 uh, that found that individuals who underwent civil commitment in Massachusetts for uh, substance abuse disorder had reduced rates of rearrest and reincarceration compared to a match comparison group. So I don't know. Uh, yeah. Is that is that the uh, is that the measure of success? Rearrest and reincarceration, maybe. I guess. You know. I mean, it's definitely a measure of success. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know what else is there out there? Workplace-based interventions, you know, um, you know, is, is that forced treatment? Like you, you, you have to go to treatment, or you lose your job, or you know, if you if you do go to treatment, you can you can keep your job. Is that- I mean, I, I think all treatment is is coercive, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and and you can voluntarily subject yourself to that, but we don't have a model that says, "All right, you want help." You, you define it in a mix because some ways if we define it ourselves, I'm, you know, we go back to, well, I'm only going to drink this type of alcohol <laughs> just at this time of day. But um, I do think there needs to be a little balance. And I, I think, you know, if you look at SAMHSA's definition of what recovery is, oh, crap, I just mentioned it. I don't have it pulled up, but it, it, it's basically, um, you know, making positive change that um, makes your life better. Maybe I'll look that up, but um but it doesn't mention abstinence. So well, I, that, ways that, right. I was going to ask going. about that because that's, yeah. you know, California sober. Um, you know, if somebody is able to recover from their alcohol uh, addiction and lack of functionality due to their drinking by smoking pot every once in a while, you know, um, would that qualify under these coercive treatment standards as recovery? Probably not. Yeah. Even though you're in think, so much in a in a better place, right? Yeah, no, and I think um, you know I would look at it that way. That if you are being a productive member of society, if you found peace and happiness, you're with you know you where are where you you want to be, and you have you know, good relations with your family, you aren't experiencing the same problems. More power to that person. And I do think you know we have this crisis. People are dying of addiction and uh, and fentanyl and we have a treatment system infrastructure that reaches about 10 percent or less and that's been consistent over the years of the people who could benefit from it so i'm not sure if what the industry has is selling is what the people want and so Mm. maybe we need to look at um you know harm reduction certainly and um maybe types of treatment that allow for, you know, moderation or a, a pathway toward, like I, it took me five years to get one year, mm-hmm. one mm-hmm. year alcohol free. And so I did sort of a glide path. It wasn't the smoothest glide path. Um, and so, and I think that's common for most people that we do our own sort of path toward, even if abstinence is becomes our goal and it's what we find, we don't get there right away. But you go unsupported until that point where you are ready to say, you know, I'm either going to gain the urine test or I'm going to be abstinent. Well, then, uh, you know, then we need a paradigm shift because people who are working towards a goal, I mean, you don't, uh, you don't fire a, a, you don't fire a cancer patient because they're not done with their treatment yet. They're still sick. Um, You know, I don't want to, I don't want to make too much of the analogy between cancer and and substance abuse, you know, because the disease model is, has, problems in and of itself but um yeah. but it's it's just if you're looking at sobri at, at uh, abstinence as the the measure of success uh it's it's a it's a much smaller cohort 
than if you sort of broaden that definition and look at people who um, are able to function and be okay with themselves if they're engaging in harm reduction strategies. Right. But yeah, it, I, I know you didn't love that John Mulaney special. And I was going to say he, <laughs> for the Netflix version compared to when he did it live, he added a whole introduction. So get past that. I watched it. I watched but, it last okay, week. Yeah. Um, I, I enjoyed what he had to say. I just, I just don't find the guy funny. I don't know. If yeah. it, it's just, that, I, I, I don't subjective. know. I can't. But I'm more of like a Norm McDonald guy. I just, yeah. This guy just the, doesn't do it for me. He's too like I, twitchy I, and shit. I don't know. I can't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the thing that, that I wanted to point out, I saw him here in Sacramento and he did a call out to the audience at one point And a woman said she had been to rehab. Yeah, I think it was, have you ever been to rehab? And this woman said, yes. And, you know, she had so many years sober. And then she clarified. She said, but I'm drinking now. And the whole crowd <laughs> oh, just shit. collectively booed. Oh, wow. Like and he said, wait, wait a minute. You know, this is her recovery. It's, it's not yours. And he asked something like, you know, but are you doing okay? And she said, yeah. And I thought that was a good sort of teachable moment mm -hmm. because we do, you know, as much as people don't like the abstinent person, they do feel like, okay, if you reach that point, then you better be abstinent and it's a failure if you aren't. Yep. And that, uh, that definition probably needs to change because especially amongst younger people who are getting sober, I, I feel like um, the definition of, of recovery does not encompass total abstinence. Yes. It's been, been my experience. Um, so speaking of entertainment, um, you, one of the notes that you sent me is that you wanted to talk about BoJack Horseman. So, so why don't we, I, why don't we I, visit I do, BoJack I'll, I'll Horseman for a bit? But really quickly, I just pulled up the SAMHSA definition. Okay, so, go ahead. So recovery is defined by SAMHSA. Um, as a process of change through which individuals improve their health and wellness, live a self-directed life, and strive to reach their full potential. Oh, I just think that's, that's nice. nice. No abstinence so, required. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if you go hog wild, it's going to be tough to, to meet those other things. So Yeah. Um, but, yeah, uh, my daughter had been a fan of BoJack Horseman. I've never been a huge fan of adult cartoons mm -hmm. uh, just find them snarky and, and not my thing but when she was home for winter break she convinced me to watch a few bojack horsemen's and she entered me in by saying this is a good starter one and that's another one you should watch but after a while i said you know why did you want to watch this with me and she said you know based on my journey with alcohol and recovery she thought it'd be good and i didn't even see that at the start and then I realized that over the arc of maybe six seasons, although you can watch it really quickly um, because they're, you know, they're short half hour or less, that it was this, you know, kind of subtle look at addiction. The, the main character, Bojack Horseman, played by Will Arnett, is a struggling actor who had his great success in the 90s and never quite regained that. And... Um, it, what I liked about it was this character, it, it just, it was very realistic because it showed that, you know, it's not as easy to say, do you want to get clean? Do you not want to get clean? He had reservations. He, he could have gone either way. Mm -hmm. And it showed he had periods of success and periods where he didn't have success. And the thing, one of the things that I really liked too, is he grappled with, um, how do I come to terms with the bad shit that I've done in the past even though it's related to addiction, they play with that a little bit. And just the, um, toward the end, I don't want to give away much of the, the plot, but toward the end of the, the whole series, there's a scene with his sidekick is, um, oh my goodness, who, who played Aaron Paul, who played Jesse Pinkman on Breaking Bad. Mm -hmm. It's this guy Todd in the show. And at the end, he has this discovery. And it's about the hokey pokey. And he's like, I figured out what it's all about. <laughs> and he's like, yeah. Well, Jack Horseman says, yeah, it's about the hokey pokey. He's like, no, listen to the song. You turn yourself about. That's what it's all about. You can turn yourself about. You can change, whatever. <laughs> when I saw that, we talked to my daughter about it. I almost cried. Hmm. You know, And um, it just it 
it, I really liked it. It became a good story about addiction and, and the struggles to recover. And what I liked about it the most is my daughter brought it to me. And I think it was a way it opened up the lines of communication. And one of the things she shared with me is that she does have this nagging fear that I will relapse. And what can I tell her to reassure? Her? Mm. I said, I don't know. I can't, I can tell you that today I'm doing the things that I need to do and that I'm sober and I have no desire to go back to what I was and that I have a, a full life and that I've sort of defined my identity and my fun and my work around recovery. So, but yeah, I've got no guarantees. It was just, it was a nice show to open up the lines of communication. So I would say, give it a few episodes and, you know, maybe jump to the, the funeral monologue episode can't remember what season, but there's an episode where it's just one Bojack Horseman monologue, and it kind of gives you the sense of what he's all about. So that's my plug. All right. A ringing endorsement for Bojack Horseman. I will uh, try and find that funeral episode and throw a link in the show notes so people can access right. it. And it is a uh, recommended viewing for the Munster uh, adult cartoon viewing society that doesn't recommended yet exist. Required. Yeah. <laughs> You don't, you don't need it to, to recover. Um, but it's helpful. So speaking of recovery, that's all we've been doing is speaking. Of, I'm, my segues aren't so good today. I'm scrolling while I'm talking to you. Um, all right. We should talk about the potential RMA meetup in November in San Francisco, because I think this is something that will be interested, interesting to uh, a, a bunch of folks that live maybe out in that direction. Yeah, definitely. When you said we should talk about it, I thought, oh, no, we should, we should talk about recovery in the workplace or alcohol in the workplace. <laughs> nah. <laughs> At this point in the show, you've already did that. We're Although, about an hour uh, in. We can, we can talk yeah, yeah. about the Munster, uh, <laughs> the Munster mash. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, Shatterproof, which I've mentioned shamelessly many times during this podcast, it does a series of walks and one of them is november 11th in san francisco so it's a a fun walk it's not a race by any means but um you know we try and get oh uh, local newscasters out there to make a big thing of it and it's sort of a party and it's an educational walk and a way for people in recovery close to those in recovery to get together and, and celebrate and um it's in it, San Francisco goes from you know down the waterfront on November 11th. And I was thinking, well, I'm going there for sure. And I was thinking, I threw it out there in the Discord. I think I put it on Facebook too, that if we get a critical mass or you know, even if we get one or two monksters, I'll take my car and we could either the Friday before or it's, it's a Veterans Day weekend. So many will have either Friday or probably Monday off. Um, I could take people to Marin County on, on Friday and I would rent a passenger van if we needed to, or we could take a caravan of rental cars and go mm. see uh, the Redwoods and some of the coastal towns there and um, go birding at Bodega Bay. It all sounds great, man. So, I mean, the deadhead in me is excited about the prospect of visiting Marin County and running into Phil Lesh at the bakery. Uh, but um, the, so the walk is on Saturday. Yeah, so the walk is Saturday morning. So Sunday would seem like the logical day for the for walking. The yeah, because okay. Monday is uh, Monday's Veterans Day, right? Right. Or most pe- observed. If, yeah, yeah. If, if that works, if that's the way, yeah, let's just make it definite here and say, yeah, Saturday's the walk, you know, fly in on a Friday or Saturday or skip that. and um, But yeah, Sunday could be the, the big thing where we go and tool around Marin County and I'm happy to rent a passenger van or we can do a caravan or rental cars. Yeah. I I should set up some kind of place where people can RSVP or something, right? Like some kind of a computer thing. So we know how many people, right? Because I'm thinking about making the trip myself because I was checking flights and they're pretty reasonable for that weekend. I cleared it with the family. So, um, so I'm probably, I'm probably like 75, 80% coming based on, you know, work. Issues. And, and your family, they have a busy time of year, but they should feel welcome too. Oh yeah. I've, I've, I put it out there. Bring your family. But, yeah. um, you know, I'm actually the only one that doesn't have that day off. <laughs> Monday off. My family all does, but you know, yeah. uh, 
So we'll see. I'm not sure who's going to be joining me yet. Maybe I'll bring one yeah. kid or something. You know? yeah. And I was thinking maybe that Saturday after the walk, um, San Francisco is a walkable city. There's great parts of it. You know, go to Golden Gate Park. It's just great to be up around there. And they hate Ashbury, which I know we've got. Speaking some- of California sober, we can uh, we'll go visit 710 Ashbury, take our picture at the Grateful Dead House. <laughs> I've somehow managed yeah. to miss the Grateful Dead House in all my trips to San Francisco. Okay, so. there you go. We'll do that. I'll we'll do the Painted Ladies. That's yeah. Nice. That's right. it, yeah. yeah. Sounds like a plan, man. So- yeah, so if you. If you can join us, and I don't know how to, the best way to work RSVPs. We aren't so organized in recovery in the Middle Ages. Not at all. <laughs> we can't. But um, <laughs> you know, if anybody, and I'll keep, I'll keep putting reminders out there on Facebook, maybe every couple of weeks, and I'll put my email, my personal email, gboykin at gmail dot com. So if you have questions, you have planning decisions, um, let me know. Yeah, awesome. Hey, thanks for. Uh, throwing this thing together. I think it's, uh, it'd be interesting to see everybody out there in person. I know uh, Liz is already planning on coming from yep. our coast. So that will be, uh, that'll be cool. Um, and I know we do have at least a couple of Bay area or Northern California RMA listeners. So I'll yeah. Awesome. Talk to them too. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we're, we're at about an hour and six, so this might be a good place to leave it. Unless there's anything All else right. you want to, Got anything else no, you want to say or I let you get on with your day now? Quite enough. I will get on with my day. Well, thank you so, very much for coming. And uh, I think it was, a, it was a good discussion. It's always great talking to you and uh, getting your wisdom on what's going on in the recovery movement and just hearing from you. And, you know, you've been such a loyal uh, friend, of, friend of the pod for so many, so many years now that uh, yeah, I always appreciate being able to spend time with you. Oh, well, thank you. It was a pleasure. It's both ways. And the appreciation of the podcast is, uh, you know, I can't understate how much, how important RMA and and other resources like this have been to me to finding a way to a better life. So super happy to do it. All All right. right. Well, get on with the rest of your day. It's getting late there. 930. Yeah. You too, Grant. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye. Say it. Say the thing. And <laughs> welcome back to Recovery in the Middle Ages. I hope you enjoyed that uh, back and forth between the great G Money Smooth and uh, Mike. Not the great Touched Mike. Touched on a lot of great. G Money Smooth is the, the great, great no, G Money yeah. Smooth, but I'm just Mike. That's it. Right, Mike. Acceptable Mike. The Mike will take her today. <laughs> Mike on the mic. <laughs> yeah, that was a good uh, yeah, interview. You, I you last time I. Top- Listen to this. This is bullshit. It's like every other podcast, just two sausages talking over each other. <laughs> I'm back here. <laughs> so what did you think of it? I, I was just going to say, I don't really remember what we talked about because it was like a week ago. Right. <laughs> but I think it was good. You know what? One thing I do remember talking about, though, mm. um, the possibility of a monster mash happening in San Francisco in November. That sounds amazing. What I'm about it? You want to go? That, but I would love to. How do I? What do I do? I think you just got to buy your ticket and <laughs> fly you to California. Fly. <laughs> <laughs> Flights are actually re- reasonable from New York. Um, I think I might go. I'm thinking about it. I think that would be awesome. It sounded to me in the um, in the discussion that you were already getting your uh, did it, did it? bags ready. <laughs> you know, you were talking about visiting the Grateful Dead house. And, oh, that's right. Yeah. You know, no, I Grant remember. does a great job selling it. You know, it's a beautiful city. It's a very walkable city. I like that. <laughs> Just got to step uh, over the piles of poo. <laughs> Almost. You know. uh, yeah, I think I'm, I'm sort of 90% there about going. So that's awesome. So any of you guys want to come? I mean, exciting. it's like, it's not a, it's not like there'll be a program. I will not be entertaining you like a train podcast host monkey. But but it will be a good time. We can all go to yeah, the beach together out. and, you know, it'll be fun. Go do the shatterproof walk and all that shit. So. Yeah, so he talked a lot about shatterproof. And um, even though he's not an official, he, he wasn't, he always is careful to say, I'm not, you know, uh, sanctioned to say anything specific right. for shatterproof. But it's a big part of his life. He's doing a lot of exciting work with the, um, with the, the Atlas program 
which I always, as soon as I heard about it, when they launched it, I thought this was a, such a great idea. Mm. And the Atlas program, it's a computer database that's searchable for addicts or anyone who's looking for local resources in recovery. So it's very, very important work that they're doing there. And, and I'm honored, honestly, that to have someone like Grant, who's actually involved in, in creating it and pushing it out there, you know, so if you can do that, that was really cool. Um, but a lot of other uh, important uh, topics came up. Um, we talked about, uh, or you talked about, the whole time I was trying to interject while I was listening to it. <laughs> It was very frustrating because there'd be spaces. And I'm like, that's where I jump in. Yes, like, yes. Oh, good, I couldn't. But, uh, you know, a lot about the uh, involuntary uh, putting people in, uh, in recovery, mm -hmm. through, like uh, treatment situations, and then you likened it to 5150-ing someone. And, uh, and I thought that, that was a really, really good topic. Do you remember that one? I do. I, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to find the recovery in the news uh, article uh, yeah, while, well, while you're, uh, I'm letting you tap dance around there. <laughs> Watch me tap dance. But, <laughs> um, you know, and uh, I, I, I'm not sure about it. And you said sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And that's how I feel like a lot of this recovery stuff is. It's like everybody's so different. You kind of have to have a starting point. And I think for a lot of people, that starting point is, you know, like myself, it was um, court mandated. Yeah, I wasn't like I was never I, I, I don't say never often, but thinking back on my mental state toward that time, I don't think I would have voluntarily sent myself to these rehabs or voluntarily put myself through the outpatient process, which is kind of torture. I'll, I'll admit, you know, they're very hard on you and it's not easy to do these things. And um, I don't think I would have gotten that far had I not been uh, mandated. So, so you're a advocate. I, I think I am. I don't like anything that takes away a person's free will, but I recognize that I, at least for myself, my free will had been hijacked by my addiction. My brain was completely rewired by the drugs. And I really wasn't in a place to make a good decision for myself at that point, because, you know, like we learned about in the, uh, those experiments about the in rat park, you know, your brain is, is working against you in a sense. So to be forced into a situation like that, to regain your ability to make decisions that are uh, good for you, I think, I think there's a place for that. Certainly there was for me. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's a, entirely a terrible idea, but I think it has to really be based on, an, like I said in the uh, interview, like an individual assessment and a really well thought out trajectory for treatment and yeah under the current system of courts and and medical the way medicine works in this country I, I i would hesitate at entering entering into something with real mandatory overtones without having that structure built around it to make sure that it's done in a way that maximizes your individual uh, freedom all at the same time, balancing that against your need for treatment. Um, yeah. And it's wishful thinking to imagine that it is in such a, you know, that it is set up to take care of people that way. So a lot of what, what they're doing right now is it's just chuck them on a different pile and hope it gets sorted out. Sometimes the systems are better than other times, but there's no consistent that I'm aware of uh, treatment plan for each and every person going through that. So whether or not they can put that together is, um, I guess it's a matter of funding and desire. I just worry that, you know, it ends, it's going to end up something like Oregon where, you know, you legalize all the drugs and then you, you, you don't do the other part. You know what you I mean? You can't go like, halfway. So yeah. you can't just you can't say, halfway. okay, we're going to have mandatory treatment without having a structure in place to make sure that the application is, is fair and people have a chance who are, who are objecting to that treatment. Maybe they need a hearing. So sort of like when you are um, involuntarily committed beyond a certain period of time, you have the right to have a, a mental hygiene attorney appointed to represent you and you, you drug have court. a hearing where you go and, you they know, have drug court and stuff like that. Maybe they could model it yeah. through the drug court. Yeah. Something. I mean, drug court's a good idea, but it's, it's, um, and I'm sure there's best practices for drug court, but I don't know. Is, is drug court, the same, no matter where you go, is it is it is it applied in a consistent manner? 
I mean, how much how much power is given to the judge versus how much power resides in the process, you know? Yeah, um, I think we would have to do more research, but my understanding is that the judge, kind of like you have with mandatory minimums when uh, with other crimes, I think there's like, mm. there's certain mandatory like thresholds that the, just from what I've heard of people I knew going through it, there's stages and there is, at least in New York or Nassau County, um, but I doubt that it would be, you know, federally... Um, the same but i think they're trying but it's how do you weave it all together in a cohesive system that you know you can count on and, and that you uh, create the best uh, chance for success I, I don't think we're there yet sorry i just sent you a text that oh, i meant okay. to send to danny no. uh, i don't think we're there yet either um and are we know, there yet are we gonna are get we there yet are we gonna get are we there, there? Yet? <laughs> are we there yet are we gonna get there anytime soon i don't know but another thing came up in the interview without going too long here, because I know we had a long interview. So we did uh, this scary drug called... Um, oh, so the, this, is the, uh, this is the, the part where you do the thing. Not that thing. No, not that one. Time for Recovery in the News. <laughs> yeah! All right. Recovery in the News. Recovery. In the news, recovery, recovery, so you can hear that. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if it'll be on <laughs> time or not. But. <laughs> well, as long as you can hear it, I wasn't sure if you could hear the comedic stylings from the board. Mysteries abound with the way we're recording today. So bear with us. Thank you. So um, it's like relearning the, the wheel. Like we did, yeah. we used to do this right back in the COVID days a yep. little bit, and then we got pretty good. Yeah, I don't know if I would ever say good, but as um, good as it's gonna get <laughs> as good as it's gonna get. I just i I would have done it in person. I'm just really nervous about getting infected with your disease. Yeah, you don't want that. <laughs> I just I can't. Like as much as I would like two days lying flat on my back, I just I can't. I, I, I got too much to do this week. So. Um, so, you know, uh, Grant and I were talking a little bit about uh, xylazine uh, on, in the interview, which is that drug that popped up in Kensington and a few other parts of um, the United States, which um, is wreaking all sorts of havoc. Uh, and funny enough, Time Magazine uh, on May 18th published an article that, where they did a deep dive into the emerging xylazine addiction crisis in the United States. And uh, xylazine apparently is a veterinary tranquilizer. Uh, it isn't meant for use in humans, but it's an increasingly common adulterant that's pervading the U.S. illicit drug supply. But little is known about its effect on the human body or how to treat the intense withdrawal symptoms it causes. Apparently, um, a 2021 study in Philadelphia, they, they tested a whole bunch of street drugs, and they found it traces of xylazine in more than 90% of the examples of uh, of the samples of drugs that they took off the streets in Philadelphia. Um, there were 434 fatal overdoses in 2021 that involved xylazine, and apparently it is in everything. Um, no, no. It, they also call it Trank. That's the street yes. name for it, Trank, man. Trank dope, um, zombie and, drug, sleep cut. Ooh. Those are things they call it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, but apparently it's really hard to get off of, um, and no, no treatment center really understands how to get somebody off this stuff. Um, because most, you know, in, people in Philadelphia are more experienced with xylazine, obviously because of its appearance in Kensington, but, but most of the programs there are designed to get people off opioids. Uh, and they tell the story of this guy who is, uh, addicted to this stuff and he was kind of basically left to fend for himself and he had an excruciatingly, long three month withdrawal Jesus. uh three months you know um and there's a lot of people there that don't even know they're on it they think they're buying heroin and yeah. they're actually getting xylazine and uh well that's you know that happens a lot i'll never forget when i was court mandated to outpatient uh rehab where there was a kid he must have been 20 who was mandated there from court and um two or three days into his uh, outpatient, uh, he, he, he first came in for cocaine for what he thought. And, you know, he said, all I ever got was cocaine. He mm. sold it. He did it. That was it. And I looked in this kid's eyes when he was telling me, I think he was being honest because he was 
looked totally shocked when he started to go into these withdrawal symptoms. And, you know, like we all know, regular cocaine, you don't really get the physical withdrawal symptoms. And so what they realized, because of course they test you and they say, Hey buddy, uh, you've, you know, you're, you're popping positive for opiates. What are you talking about? Hmm. And it, it was a total surprise, but now that's that same thing. People think they're on cocaine or they're buying Xanax and they're, maybe there's just enough to not kill them, but knock them out and make them feel, you know, relaxed, but then they get an addiction to fentanyl and it's going to be the same thing with this. It's like, surprise, you're addicted. Yeah. And like the government hasn't really done anything about it. It's pretty unregulated. Not that the government doing anything about this stuff really makes a hell of a lot of difference to begin with. Yeah. But, um, you know, they're at least passing bills uh, with some money in them so that they can study xylazine and kind of figure out how to treat it. Um, but I don't know. It's <laughs> Well, it's another thing to look out for, that's for sure. And, it, and if you didn't think it was bad before with fentanyl, I mean, now you've got... This reminds me of that. Did you ever see that documentary? They call it like lizard or something. Yeah. And it's some like concoction that uh, popped up in Europe where they would, the same thing, they would develop sores and it would make them look like zombies yeah. or get reptile skin. So it sounds like this is another drug that will also, you know, create these sores. And it's just even more deadly, disgusting and horrifying to be addicted to. So, geez. It's, uh, it's, it's, it isn't approved for human consumption, but it's also not considered a controlled substance. So yeah. it's not regulated by the U.S. government. I don't even think that, means it's illegal it's like um, bath salts before yeah. they crack down on it apparently when you start getting sick from the trank you start shaking violently salivating and vomiting you're pretty much just a mess on the ground mm -hmm. so uh i don't know doing drugs these days doesn't seem like it's as much fun as it used to be <laughs> <laughs> That's, i mean what yeah. it's all this shit out there it's gonna i don't know oh i found a syringe by the way near the house the other day oh lovely yeah, what up kind? by the church uh, is it like one of the uh, syringes for uh, diabetics that is used for heroin? Could be. I didn't pick it up. I just took a picture of it. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, it's out there, and it scares the shit out of me. And the more I talk to my son about what's happening in the seventh grade, the more I want to tell him. Uh, I'm trying to be very explicit with him about what is going on in the world. And I don't leave any illusions as to what is up. Ben professes to have no idea that anybody in the seventh grade is is using drugs or vaping or anything. He claims total ignorance. Mm. I believe him too because he's, he's he he like tells me stuff, you know. Yeah, and I think Noah is being over. He is disclosing too much. I think because I feel like he hears it from kids who hear it from older kids, mm. and probably it's not getting as close to him as he wants to believe. Right. Maybe he thinks it's cool or something, but so I'm sort of worried, not worried you right? Know, because I feel like we have a good relationship and I don't know if he's just trying to show me that, that he's open to talk about it because he knows it's important to me. There's no mystery about what we talk about on our show you yeah. know? Um, and how, you know, we're, I pretend to be an expert, but I try to, to give it to him straight without doing scare tactics and without uh, divulging too much of my past. Mm -hmm. Just that this is more dangerous than you think, buddy. And I think they know. Well, don't worry. It's only the seventh grade. Things are going to get much more intense. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm told. Yeah. Well, hopefully he'll get into enough theater programs and symphonic band things. And yeah, I you know that's the idea. And that's recovery in the news. Recovery in the news. Da, da, yeah. Da, 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 da. Usually I can hear it better. Sorry. Well, what a great show. Is that like a diva moment there? <laughs> like, my background new music is not loud enough. <laughs> Damn it. Where is it in my headphones? Um, that about does it for today, does it? That's it, I think. Thanks for tuning hey, in. Thanks for, uh, yeah, thanks for putting up with us in the, the last couple of weeks. We're, we're fighting... Destiny. We're trying to make sure that we can keep going regardless of how crazy things seem to be. And don't forget, um, support your favorite show. Um, uh, 
visit us at middleagesrecovery.com, <laughs> Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Facebook, Instagram, Spotify, YouTube, and Twitter. So tweet us at twat, you twit, support your favorite show, that's us. Drop us a five-star review on Apple iTunes. Join the private Facebook group. Um, we're going to have new t-shirts and merch coming soon. We are. I'm still working on that. With, okay. I'm working on it with SRO Prints. Uh, I haven't followed up with that one. Uh, we love meeting new monsters and chopping it up on the Facebook group. Join the Inner Sanctum. That's uh, patreon.com slash recovery in the middle ages, recovery in the middle ages. And uh, talk to us there and all of the great monsters celebrating and recovering together. And finally, the best way to help the show is to share it with who? With a, fr- a friend. A friend. A friend. Um, right. A friend. <laughs> and the best way to help grow the RMA movement is to share it. And as we say... Non proficiat perfectum. It's progress, not perfection. Definitely not perfection. See you next time. Hare Krishna. Uh, and stay fresh, you cheese Hare. bags. Be good. Bye. Every day